What's new about the new year? Everything? Or nothing? Almost everything? I don't know, what is new for you about the new year? Everything and nothing. <laughs> At the same time. You know, I've been con considering, I've been wondering, if there's really a point in doing two sets of sermons, like we do a Saturday sermon and a Sunday sermon. So the thought has been crossing my mind, if there's... Because it's a different audience, but the same... <coughs> there's a camera staring at me and... I'm conscious that there are people who are watching this from... <coughs> wherever. And then that just means that the audience to which I speak is never certain. So, this is like a repeat. But then I can't say the same thing again because I don't memorize, this is not a prepared speech. But then at the same time, I sometimes tend to forget what I have said on a Saturday and then I continue from there on a Sunday. And that's unfair to those who come on to the Sunday sermons. So I've been wondering, what I should be doing, really. The thought did cross my mind whether we should not record these and put them online and just do it for people who come to the monastery. Because really, the majority of those who join in person here are those who are either permanent residents of the monastery or those who visit us regularly, maybe sometimes even daily. But then I realized, because they're not permanently resident here, there may be the odd occasion where you're not able to come to the monastery on a particular day, and then you might want to watch it online. So I really am torn, <laughs> not really certain what to do, but I want to make these sessions productive. Because it is an investment of time, isn't it? There's no such thing called your time and my time. It's just time, time for all of us to achieve one purpose, that is Nibbana. I don't want you wasting your time and I don't think you want me wasting my time because it is no, there's no owner to time. It's just opportunities passing us by. Then I thought maybe the, fa the, the, the fairest way of doing this is possibly to do one sermon for devotees and the other for the devoted. Which one are you? Are you devotees or are you the devoted? The devotees or the devoted? So I thought perhaps I should maybe ignore the camera. Which might mean that these sermons might have to be heavily edited before they get online. <coughs> because these sermons would then not come with caveats. But then at the same time, there will be the, the odd devotee. I don't know whether you are a devotee or a devoted, right? So that is up to you to decide. And then I just need to make sure that none of you feel that you are offended by what I say, because this is not meant to offend anyone. The truth is the truth, isn't it? If you're black, I'm going to say you're black. That's not meant to offend. If you're fair, I'm going to say you're fair. And if you're unfair, I'm going to say you're unfair. That's just the truth. It's not meant to offend anyone, but it is so that people generally tend to feel very offended because they feel this heavy sense of self within them and they're very self-conscious. But then how long can you keep a baby on the bottle? It comes a time where you have to wean them off that and get them to eat proper food so that they can grow and become become someone, right? So, I think for the time being, I'll, let's keep the camera rolling. These sermons might have to be edited a fair bit, so they may not be as long as the actual sermon is. Maybe you'll get like 10 minutes of this on a Saturday. So that will be extra work for the editors. And for those who actually make an effort to come in on Saturdays, I need you to recognize and realize that, or at least bear in mind, 
that this sermon is going to be focused on those who have devoted themselves to the Buddha Sasana. That does not mean that you have to be a monk or an anagarika, even if you have devoted yourself, let's say, at least one day a week, or at least two days a week. Because otherwise the, the practical advice and guidance that you get will not be relevant to you if the most of your practice is going to be at home and all you get to do is listen to a sermon. Because there'll be things that I'll ask you to do which you simply cannot. Then it's not productive, is it? If I ask you to do something that requires you being at home for two hours every day, three hours, six hours every day, then that's not going to be practical for those who are, let's just say, devotees. That's not to say one is better than the other, it just means how much you have been able to commit yourself to the course of Nibbana. So there, are, there is the Sunday sermons for those who are trying to enter. So that's why you call it the gateway to Nibbana. But then once you've walked through the gate, now there's the path to Nibbana. So the Sunday sermons will be focused on that, getting people to enter through the gateway. And then the Saturday sermons, We'll see. I mean, you know, you know what I'm like. I'll say one thing today and then do something completely different the following day. Right? So, but I think that will be more productive because even on Sundays I've, I've invited people who come to the Sunday sermons to start to make some changes in their lives, at least to begin considering you know, if they can go on to become a Sila Sravaka or a Sravika, at least a Sila Vesi. So that, that means you're, you're spending at least two days of your life, of your week, at the monastery. You know, this is not because we just want people here. No, every time there's another head, that's another head to feed. So it's not that we want people here. We are not amassing a fan base. Right? This is not a cult. This is not a movement. But it's a personal mission for each and every one of us to actually do something useful and productive with our lives, isn't it? I feel about this personally. I, I, I don't want to waste my time and I don't want you to waste your time because time is time, this is human time. Human time in a time where the Buddha's Dhamma is prevalent and this is precious. So I don't want just to be tickling you on a Saturday morning. We've got to be serious. And by serious I don't mean we don't smile, we don't enjoy the sermons, that's not what I mean. It's not like I'm just going to put a long face on and, you know, doing this all the time. <laughs> That's not what I mean. I need people who are dedicated to the purpose of Nibbana. And it will happen for all of you in due course. There are only two kinds of people in this world, those who have understood the Dhamma and those who haven't. Simple as that. You know, they think they have wives, they think they have husbands, they think they have houses, they think they have children, they think they have property and wealth and material possessions. They think they are they. Right? So, living in an imaginary world, they just interact with imaginary creatures in this imaginary world, and then they suffer. And then they look forward to having, enjoying pleasure, experiencing pleasure. I, this is just silly. Silly, completely silliness. Right? So, if any of you feel that you have been offended, it's not you I'm talking about, it's everybody else. Okay? So when I say people who haven't understood the Dhamma are crazy, and if you feel that you are offended, then you have understood the Dhamma. So therefore, you're not crazy. You need not be offended. I mean, I have to call a spade a spade. If you don't face the facts, nothing's going to happen internally. And, and on the other hand, I feel that you deserve something for having made that commitment that you have. Right? There are those among you who, who've gone the extra mile, who've, gone, who, who, who've done really everything you can do in your power to try and commit yourself to the cause of Nibbana. I know this was not an easy task. I mean, the two gentlemen over there, right? they've left their homeland, they've left their families, they've left their loved ones, and they've come here. There are others here as well, among the Anagarikas and so on. These are people who have left their lives behind, left their families behind, left their parents behind, amidst much objection, 
And they have come all the way because they want to do something useful with their lives. So if they're also sat in the audience, and there are shavikas, right? It's not like you have nothing better to do with your time. Then there are those who come and spend their weekends here. It's not that you don't have nothing better to do with your time. So if you've made that commitment, then I think I have to honor that. And you deserve to be guided in the best way possible. So the long and short of all that is I want to try and make this session a session for the devoted and the Sunday sermons for the devotees. My wish is that all devotees become devoted. So then that might mean that we have no more devotees. That's okay. We are not here for the devotees. We are here for those who are devoted. The devotees will eventually become a devoted individual. Are you, are you happy with me just attending Nibbana and you just you know, saying hurrah, hurrah, hurrah and cheering me on? Is that what you want? I know that's not what any of you want. It's not what I want. And I don't want anything for you that I don't want, want, that I don't want for myself. And whatever I want for myself, I want for you as well. So, there you have it. Right, let's chant the Namaskar and continue with today's proceedings. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa I made the bold claim that people who have not understood the Dhamma are crazy. Now you should wonder why. Why is it that we say that people who haven't understood the Dhamma are crazy? There are only two kinds of people in this world. You can s split the whole world into whether it's people or beings. Right? All animals fall into the side of individuals or sentient beings who haven't understood the Dhamma. There is those with the Dhamma, and there is with those without Dhamma. These guys are crazy. A mind that does not understand the nature of the world expects things that don't exist out there. The Dhamma is essentially your perspective on life. It is how you are meant to interpret life. Remember, the mind has no choice but to perceive whatever object is put in front of it. Yeah, let's get it, take it from there. When I put this object in front of your eyes, you have no choice about perceiving this. You have to perceive it. Try and stop yourself from perceiving this if you can. I dare you. Anyone? You can't not perceive this. You have to perceive this. It is a must. There's no option there. It's mandatory that you perceive this. Therefore, you don't need to make a conscious decision about that. You can't. You can't choose not to perceive this, right? So there's no choice there. Why is there no, cho why is there no choice? Because it's cause and effect. <coughs> that is what governs everything in this world. That is the overarching phenomenon. Cause and effect. So if you can't, help but perceive an object that is placed in front of your mind, let's say, to keep it simple, then the difference is whether you perceive it correctly or wrongly. This is the only difference there is. Does that make sense to everyone? If you have no choice about perceiving something, okay, so it's, it's a bit like this. I'm going to throw this at someone. You can't stop me from doing that because it is I who choose to do that. You can either catch it or not catch it. If you catch it, then it's in your possession. If not, then it'll drop on the, fall on the floor, whatever. But you can't choose whether I throw this at you or not. In the, in the same way, this is an object and you have a mind. 
When I put this object in front of your mind, there's no choice about perceiving it. The only difference in the way is the way in which you perceive it. You can either perceive it with the Dhamma or without the Dhamma. That's the only difference. Now, now try and simplify. All sentient beings in this world are like that. Whatever transformation is happening within you is the same. When you misinterpret or let's say misperceive, that such a word probably doesn't even exist in the dictionary, I'm making it up, but as long as you understand it, incorrectly perceive, wrongly perceive, misperceive. Anyone, any misperceives here? If you misperceive an object that is put in front of your mind, that is presented to your mind, then no questions there, you suffer. Simple as that. If you misperceive an object, you suffer. If you rightly perceive an object, you, can I say you're happy? Are you happy then? Then what? You don't suffer, that's all. There's no such thing called being happy. Let's clearly understand what's going on with our lives and try and make sense of this. There is no such thing, such thing called being happy. Although we title this the Buddha's Guide to Happiness, it's really the Buddha's Guide to be without suffering. That's all. You can't create happiness. You can only eradicate suffering. Have you heard of the, the, the noble truth of happiness? You haven't, have you? No, there's the noble truth of suffering. There's the noble truth of the cause of suffering. There's the noble, there's the noble truth of the cessation of suffering and the path to cessation of suffering. The Buddha doesn't speak of happiness, really. <laughs> so he has not given such a guide to happiness. All he has given us is a guide to eradicate the suffering that happens in our minds. Therefore, a mind that does not suffer is our target state. So then, therefore, it would not be right to say that the mind that has the Dhamma is happy, really what you should be saying, to be technically precise, is that it's a mind that... <coughs> in which there's no suffering. Now do you see the relationship? Dhamma, no suffering. No Dhamma, suffering. If you have the Dhamma, do you perceive something, and you don't have the Dhamma, you don't perceive something. Is that true? No, because there's no choice about perceiving. There's no choice about perceiving. So is there a choice about suffering then? Yes? yes? Think again. Is there a choice about suffering? I've just told you, if you have the Dhamma, you don't suffer. If you, have, if you don't have the Dhamma, you suffer. I, I know what you mean by, yes, there's a choice. But really, there is no choice. I have taken out choice here because I have given you the causes that lead to suffering. If the mind has the Dhamma, there's no suffering, whether you like it or not. You can't suffer if you have the Dhamma. If you have the Dhamma, if you have the Dhamma, how do you suffer? Can you suffer if you have the Dhamma? You can't, even if you wanted to. I mean, you wouldn't want to. Clearly, but if you had the Dhamma, now you, clear, you correctly interpret, you correctly per perceive an object. So if you can correctly perceive an object, there is no room for suffering there. So suffering is not something you do out of choice. It happens because of causes. And it is these causes that the Buddha discovers upon becoming a Buddha. That's why he says, the cause of suffering, not the choice of suffering. There is no choice about suffering, just as there is no choice about not suffering. These are the causes. What the Dhamma does is it eradicates attachment in the mind. So therefore the absence of Dhamma, in other words, if this is Buddha Dhamma, this is Mara Dhamma. Another way to put it is, this is the true understanding of the world and this is a false understanding of the world. If you have a false understanding of the world, now you are attached to the world. And if there is attachment to the world, then you suffer. By world, I mean what the mind can perceive. Sights and sounds and smells and taste and touch. 
Now we need to start talking about these things in a little bit more detail. So you'll begin to realize that the world that you're attached to is a world that you create yourselves. We've started to talk about this a little bit, but we need to make progress. And the more you begin to realize this, the more you'll begin to make sense of what I said right at the beginning. People who have no dhamma are people who are crazy. This is an attempt, an effort to help you heal your mind so that you don't suffer, to get here. That is why we give the dham. That is why we deliver the sermons. That is why you need to make an effort to understand it. Then again, you'll ask me, Swami Nasa, is it a choice that we have to understand the dham? Am I making a choice to understand the dham? Can you not understand what I'm saying? Hmm? Today is Saturday. Try not to understand that. Don't understand what I'm telling you. Why did you just understand that? See, you can't, there's no choice there either. If there are causes, there's always a result or an effect. So what are we doing by bringing ourselves to the monastery then? What are we doing us by, by keeping ourselves in noble association? Once we've identified what the causes are, we keep ourselves in those environments where we, which are conducive to our attaining salvation, our attaining Nibbana. So this is not a discussion about choice, really. I don't want to go that way because that's a topic for another day. But what I want for, for all of us to be clear on is one thing. That is, if you're on this side of the fence, you will suffer and that is only because you are yet to fully understand the Dhamma. That's all. No, no other reason. Your efforts, all your tasks, all your objectives and all your efforts to engage in merits and whatever you do in life, there's only one thing that is worth doing. Try to get yourself onto the other side so you have the Dhamma. Therefore, you will not suffer. So whenever there is suffering in your life, I need you to be utterly convinced that the only reason you suffer is because in that regard, you're missing something, and that is the Dhamma. Never have any doubts about that. So whenever you're upset about something, whenever you're bothered about something, whenever you're annoyed, when you're at home, in the workplace, right? if ever you're suffering, it's only because of one reason, and that is because there is no Dhamma in that regard. You may, have, you may have understood some parts of the Dhamma, but there's a part of Dhamma that you haven't understood yet. Maybe you have understood the actual teaching, but you, you are yet to comprehend it. So don't be in any doubt whatsoever. The cause for your suffering is because you are yet to fully grasp the Dhamma. That's all. If I suffer, that is because I'm yet to understand the Dhamma. If you suffer, it's the same thing. Now let's try and work out what is this Dhamma that we need to understand so that we don't suffer. Why do, pe why do people, or why do we say that people are crazy? Let's take a look at what really exists in this world, in the real world, and then we'll try and understand how people create an imaginary world in which they go on to live. And therefore, as a result of that, how suffering is created in the mind. Let's take any object. Okay, let's take this. This is an object. This object, when you look at it, you may either like it or you may dislike it. And some might feel neutral about it. If I asked you, for those in the room who like this object, right? So this is any object, okay? You can substitute with this with anything that you might have in your mind, okay? But let's just keep it for simplicity's sake. Those among you who like this object, and if I ask you why is it you like this object, let's just assume that you like the color red. You like the color red, for instance. Now if I ask you why do you like this object, you will tell me something that is not true, unfortunately. There is nothing in this object to like or dislike. But if you like this object, 
or dislike this subject, and I ask you why, whatever answer you give me, it is not true. <coughs> That's a bold statement to make, but one that is true nonetheless, and I need you to understand this. Let me say that again. When I present this object to you, and I ask you this question, do you like this object? You have an answer, yes or no. If we assume for a moment that you like the color red, right? because most of you will have a favorite color, there are things that you will like, that's why when you go shopping, you buy things in a certain color. Right? What color is your car? Chances are you, you chose that color. What color are your walls painted? Chances are you chose that color. What color are your carpets? What color is your sofa? Chances are you chose that color. Right? You chose that color because it's a color that you like. Now you know that the eyes can only help you see color. It doesn't help you see anything else. There is only color. When I present this object to you, color is the only characteristic that your eyes can pick up, isn't it? It, doesn't, it cannot pick up the smell of this, it cannot pick up the taste of this, it cannot pick up the weight of this, it cannot pick up its density, it cannot pick up anything about this besides the fact of whatever color this is. Right? So for the time being, I'm saying this is colorful and you like the color red. But now I ask you the question again, do you like this object? And when you say, yes, I like this object, and if I ask you why, you say, Swaminathan, so it's a red duster and I like the color red, so therefore I like this duster. Unfortunately, what you have said is false. It is not true. What part of that is not true? The color. Because this is not red. You're giving me a false reason. You're giving me an irrational reason for liking this object. You're liking this for something that this, I mean, this has no merits. Whatever you say is the reason you like this object is not true because it does not have the characteristic that you like. It's not red. So what color is it then if it's not red? Are we just seeing different colors to what actually are? No. What color is this? It has no color. Remember, the mind, when it opens its five senses, your senses are slaves to your mind. When, when the mind opens its five slaves or sends the five slaves out to bring in things that pleases it, the only things that these five slaves can bring and deliver to the mind are sights and sounds, smells, taste and touch. These are the five things. Any objections to that? Right? We've, discussed, we've talked about this countless times by now. So you know when you open your eyes, you bring in sights. It's not because the eyes want to see, it's because the mind wants to see. Yeah? You know that you're here, you are born with ears because you, can, you want to hear. Who wants to hear? The mind wants to hear. Does the ear wish to hear? No, the ear is just an apparatus. It's just there. It doesn't even know it's hearing. It doesn't know what purpose it's there to serve. Honestly, your ear doesn't know what purpose it's there to serve. It's just there. When there are vibrations, there's the eardrum that vibrates. The eardrum doesn't know that I'm here to, to perceive sound for you. The ear, the ear doesn't know that. The eye doesn't know what it's there to do. It just serves a purpose. So therefore, it's the mind that, that wants all these sensations. And therefore, these are the five slaves that the mind makes use of. Now, if the mind can only perceive sights and sounds, smells and taste and touch, can the mind attach to anything else? What do you think? Do you love someone you don't know? Do you like someone you don't know? Why? That's a silly question, isn't it? How can you like or love someone you don't know? Because when you say, I like someone, you like them because they are some way, isn't it? Isn't it? When you say, I like someone, you say that because they are a certain way. If I ask you, why do you like your friend? your best friend, you'll say it's because they're, they're so-and-so, they're nice, they're kind, you know, they're whatever. You're talking about a characteristic about the friend. Here's, where, here's why I say we're all silly if we think that, if, if, we, if the mind does not have the Dhamma. 
When I ask you, why is it that you like someone or you love someone, you are going to give me a long list of things about that person. But none of them are true. So your attachment to things is based on complete and utter lies. I just need you to understand that. That's it. Once you've understood it, I no longer need to remove your attachment to anything. When you realize that the things that you're attached to are not things that exist in the objects or the people that you're attached to, then I, I, I've got nothing else, to, nothing else to do with you. You've already done it. Let me give you a simple example or a simple analogy to understand this concept. Let's say, okay, let's say a man wishes to become a father, okay? Because he wishes to become a father, he goes looking for a woman who can bear, bear children. So now he, he, it is one of his requirements. He wants to get married, so he can go on to become a father. And he f comes across a woman and he asks the question, are you fertile? Would you be able to bear a child for me? And the woman says, yes, I can. So she, he brings her home and they, have, they, they, they want to have a child now. But no matter how much they keep on trying, the, the woman does not bear children. This man begins to realize that she's not going to be able to bear a child for me. You may have heard similar stories. And then in the end, she, he decides, no, this is not the woman I want to be with because I can't have a child with her. Therefore, he divorces her. So this attachment that the man had towards his woman is because he wanted something from her. I've heard plenty of stories where men have divorced their wives or when wives have divorced their, their husbands because they couldn't, they couldn't have children together. Oh, there's plenty of that. What that proves to us is, if you don't get what you expect from an object or a person, then there's no longer attachment towards that object or person. That's how people come together, they live together, but after a while they go their own ways, if they can't get what they want from them. There are times where, take our monks for example, or Anagarika Mahatmins, some of them have lived together as husbands and wives. After a while, one of the party, they begin to listen to the Dhamma. Sometimes both of them do. But one gets the Dhamma more than the other. They, they understand it more. And then, as they continue with their practice, they begin to realize the futility of existence. They begin to understand that, they, that running after pleasures is a meaningless purpose to life. And then their, their lives become dedicated and focused on attaining salvation, their Nibbana. So after a while, the husband or the wife, who's a party who has not yet understood the Dhamma, they realize that I can't get what I want from my husband or my wife here on. Right? They want to go part to parties, but the wife doesn't want to, the husband doesn't want to, because they begin to realize, what's the point of going to a party? Music is something that is created in my mind, why go to a party for that? A picture or an image is something I create in my mind, why go watch films for that? Why should I go to the theater for that? Why should I go to the movies for that? Taste is something I create in my mind. Why go to the restaurant for that? So once they begin to understand these things, they begin to settle down. They begin to become more domestic and less a traveler. But if the other party wants to keep, you know, go traveling, see the world, enjoy life as they've always been doing, then they begin to realize, well, there's no point living in this, with this woman anymore. She's not giving me what I want. I can't enjoy my life any longer with living with her. So therefore, they let her go. They give up. They break up. It has happened in the past. It is happening today and it will happen in the future. Maybe some of you are going through that. <laughs> Remember, there are only two types of people in this world. There are not husbands and wives. There are men and women. There are no blacks and whites. All there are people with the dumb and people with no dhamma. Or rather, minds with the dhamma and minds with no dhamma. Simple as that. So why did this man who wanted to live with this woman later on decide that I no longer have any interest for her? Because he had a long shopping list of things 
He had expectations set on her, but now those expectations are not being fulfilled, so therefore there's no point living with her anymore. And then they give up. Now, what does this tell us? What this tells us is, all of your attachments to anything or anyone is based on what you expect to get out of them. And if you can't get what you want, then you will no longer be attached to it. Simple as that. You're not attached to this for the, for, you know, just for the sake of being attached to it. There's nothing like that. You're not attached to anything for the sake of being attached. You're attached to something because you think you can get something from it. Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? I need you to understand this point before we go any further. You're only attached to something because you think you can get something from it. Let's put the think to a side for a second. You're only attached to something because I can get something from it. Something that you like. What I'm trying to prove to you is you think you can get something from it. It's not really there. Your attachments are based on this. You think you can get something from it. But if you begin to realize, if you begin to understand that you just think you can get something from it, it's not real. It's not, you can't really get anything from it. You, it's what you think you can. Now, you realize it's just a thought. It's just an imagination. It's just a creation of the mind. And then, you begin to question from yourself, what is the point of being attached to that object? So, let's go back to this. You like this because it is red. So much so, if, that, if this was another color, you, you would not want it. I mean, take these flowers, for example. You like these flowers because it's a certain color. Okay? If these were black, for example, let's say it was just black, all of this black, you probably wouldn't even use this for a table decoration. You wouldn't even buy it. You wouldn't take a second look at it. But why have, has someone decided to keep these flowers over here, these flowers over there, you know, those flowers over there, the, 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 the flower decorations? Would you choose black for a flower decoration? Completely black, just, just dark black, would you? No, why not? Give me an answer, why not? Because? Because you don't like it. What do you not like? Black, right? You don't like black. You don't like black, I mean, you like black hair, you like a black horse, but you don't like black flowers. So what, what color do you like your flowers in? Pink, hmm? white, yellow, red, purple, violet. These are the colors in which you like your flowers, but you don't like it black. So if I could, if I had a magic wand, and I change the color of these flowers to black. Would you take them home with you? It depends on the contrast though. Of course. Once again, we're talking about color, isn't it? Yeah. yeah? So that's, 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 that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. Your, your liking to something is based on a characteristic you believe is inherent in the object. See, when you, when you talk about contrast, right now contrast is exactly what you're looking at. Because, you know, you, the reason you know that this is pink is because the, it's, the background is not pink. If the background were pink and the foreground was also pink, now you wouldn't even see these, color, see these flowers. You see the writing on this board because the board is white and the writing is blue. If the board was also blue, you wouldn't see the writing. So then the reason that you like these flowers is not because you actually see flowers. You're seeing contrast. You're seeing a difference in foreground and background. But when you look at this image, when you look at this site, 
your mind is able to pick up individual sight elements. All you see are individual sight elements because these are light rays bouncing off this, falling on your retina, and then working, through, working their way through your brain and then into your mind, and you see individual light elements or images which are then compounded. They're compounded to give you the object that you need to perceive as a flower. What you're really seeing are simply elements of color. So, going back to the point I was trying to make, your liking to this object, to these flowers, because I asked you, would you like them in black? Chances are you don't. I mean, most people don't like flowers in black. Because whatever, yes, perhaps if you had a white background, maybe you could put the black flowers there, and maybe you might say, well, I like that. Once again, you like it because you think it's, it's, it's colorful. That's the point I'm trying to make. You think that something is colorful, you, if, you, if, you if you took a, a, a flower and you said, I, I like the smell of this, you hold it to your nose and you take a deep breath and go, that's, very, that's a sweet smell. Now I ask you, why do you like those flowers? Take a jasmine, right? You hold it to your nose and you say, I like this smell. I like this flower. I ask you, why? Because it smells nice. See, once again, you're talking about something that you believe is a characteristic of the object. You think the sm it's the flower that gives you the smell. That's why you like it. Why do you like the food that you like? Because it tastes nice. You see, you're wrong in, in, in making that judgment. You, you think it tastes nice. You think the object, you think the food tastes nice, but the food has no taste. It doesn't have a taste to taste nice. What does a biscuit taste like? Now you say, a biscuit. <laughs> What does cake taste like? You say, a cake. No. They don't taste like anything because they don't have taste. These are all creations of the mind. You have a question? Go on. But the tongue has like receptors on it. Yes. Remember, like, that's how we were doing experiments with us. I mean, like salt and sugar. So there are certain parts of your tongue that can sense. Yes. What do they sense? taste, right? Yeah. <laughs> but they don't. That's what we get into. Okay? They don't sense taste because taste is not something that is inherent in an object. Now, if you take that example of the tongue, there are receptors. Let's say this is the shape of a receptor. There are molecules in your food that, has a, that have a complementary shape. These are complementary shapes. This shape fits this receptor. It's a shape, not a taste. What taste is this shape? What do rectangles taste like? See, now you begin to understand. These are shapes, they're not tastes. But these nerve endings are stimulated when a particular, a complementary shape comes and fits into the receptor. So these neurons, when they are stimulated, they are able to convey an electrical current which the brain working with the mind interprets as taste. So therefore, taste is not in the object. In, this, in the same way, color is not in the object. Color is not something that is here, but if I ask you, why do you like this? You tell me it's because it's red. This is the problem. This is exactly what I, want, what I want you to understand. Why do you like these colors, these flowers? Because you say it's, red, it's, it's pink. You like, you like pink flowers. That's wrong, ladies and gentlemen. There are no such thing called, called pink flowers. The flowers are there. You create pink in your mind. It is pink that you want. It is white that you want. It's the jasmine smell that you want. It's cake that you want, the taste of it. Remember, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. All of these five are products of the mind. They are not something objects can convey to you. The object cannot deliver such a thing to you. Then why do you attach yourselves to the objects? I take it that you need it. They support that process. 
So without the complementary shape, you're never going to be able to taste, say, sugar, for example. Right? If this was the shape of a sugar molecule, you're not going to be able to taste sweetness if this shape wasn't, wasn't available. But you know, that's just the way the tongue is made. I mean, you, you, you can only give credit to the tongue for that. You know, what if the tongue didn't work with shapes? What if the tongue was an, ob was, was an, was a, was an organ that was not receptive to, to shapes? Now what taste is sugar? You, know, you are at the mercy of molecules having certain shapes because you have receptors that, are, that have a complementary shape. So what taste is sugar? Try and make sense of what I'm trying to get across to you. So, and then you realize, you know, this is all crazy madness. You know, the only reason... Okay, I'll give you an analogy. The only reason that you keep going to work is because they pay you money that you can use. What if they paid you in rocks? Rocks. Or they paid you in rubles. In our country, you can't use rubles. Or they paid you in lira. In our country, you can't use them. So the only reason that you go to work is because they pay you in a currency that you can use. Yeah? See, the only reason you can perceive taste is because in the world out there, there are molecules that have particular shapes and you have receptors that are complementary to that shape. That is why you taste them as taste. That's why you perceive taste. Taste does not exist. It's not a real thing. This is simply a handshake. Why do I say this is a handshake? Here's one hand, here's the other hand. They are complementary. That's why this handshake can occur. I, if you had no organ, just think about this. If your body had no organ that was capable of attaching itself to a molecule that had a particular shape, now how would you sense taste? You wouldn't. The only reason, you're at the mercy of shapes, complementary shapes fitting together. You're at the mercy of that. The reason, the only reason you smell something called, no, the only reason you perceive something called smell, taste is the same, is because there are shapes and there are receptors. That's what there are, not smells and tastes. Is that the same with touch as well? Yep. Yes, so the reason that touch, how touch, touch works is because you have receptors again. Right? Whatever you, 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 you can sense if you, when you hold an object is because there are pressure receptors. If you, when, you, when you press this object, now this duster is softer than the pen. And this is a science lesson, by the way. This is not Buddhism. Okay? But that's okay, because what I want you to understand is that these sensations that you're attached to, they don't exist out there. They're all creations of the mind. That's okay. So that step is important to make progress and get ourselves, take ourselves to the, to the next step. When you press against this, it feels soft. In fact, the, the same object, if you press against this side, it feels hard. This side feels soft. This is so because when you press this side again, you, with your finger, you can keep going until the receptors that are further into your skin. So there are, recept there are two types of recept receptors. There are receptors that can sense that there are, that will be triggered right on the surface. And then there are other receptors that are further back in your skin, in the, in the various layers of your skin, they're, the, they're further back. So because this is soft, you can keep pressing it until those receptors at the back and the, in the back layers are stimulated. So it's, it's like this, if I drew it on the board. This is a hard object. And say so this is a soft object. Okay? 
Now, when you put your finger against a hard object, this is your putting your finger against a soft, soft object. Here are receptors. These receptors detect hard surfaces. These receptors, have I got that right? Hmm? Oh yeah, see the other way around. So these are the soft, soft ones and these are the hard ones. Right, Liv, shall I put in another color? Put in another color. Okay, there you go. So the red ones are the soft, they, they detect softness, and the, red, the, the, the green ones detect hardness, okay? Now, you, once you listen to this, you tell me whether it is really softness or hardness that is detected, or whether it's simply a way, the way in which the brain interprets, or the mind interprets this. Now, because this is a hard object, because this is a hard object, there's only so far your, your finger can go. Or, or rather, when you, when you press this, as your finger presses, compresses against this object, okay, these receptors, these receptors are triggered with very little effort because it's a hard object. So as you press your finger against a hard surface, the the hardness receptors, let's have we call it the hardness receptors, and these are the softness receptors, right? The softness receptors, of course, you know, they come into contact almost immediately, right? So even, now, how do you say something's hard? You know, if you just merely touch it with the surface, you can't say it's hard. You've got to keep going, right? If you keep compressing your finger and keep pushing it a little bit further in, you realize that the hardness receptors are quickly triggered without, you, having, without you, you, you actually going in a lot further in. But when you say something soft, what that means is your softness receptors are the same, right? Both, both sides, it works the same. But you can keep going in a little bit further, and this object will, will um, shall we say compress? Sorry? It gives way, yes. This object gives way before the hardness receptors are triggered. Whereas we hear, it happens immediately. So, because it's your finger that's giving way. Here, the object is giving way. All that's happening is these nerve endings are triggered. So, at the brain, there'll be a part of the brain that is sensitive to, to these receptors. These nerve endings, the red ones, will be picked up in both instances. Remember, whether you're talking about a hard object or a soft object, the softness receptors are triggered almost immediately. That's why you can't say whether something is soft just by touching it. You have to press it before you know it. What do you do when you press? You're giving yourself the, the opportunity to compress or rather um, stimulate the hardness receptors. When you simply rub against the surface of an object, whether it's hard or soft, right, these softness receptors are the same. They're triggered in both instances. But you say something's hard because when you, if you take this side of the object, which is the hard surface, you need not push in much further in before the hardness receptors are triggered. Whereas if it's the soft side of an object, you have to keep going in because the object gives way. Here, the finger has to give in. That's the difference. So when these two nerve endings are triggered, there's a part of the brain that says, okay, when the, if the red ones are triggered, now that's a soft object. But with the hard object, because even when you keep pushing in, you have to go very little before, before the hardness receptors are triggered, now the object says that's a hard object. Aren't all soft objects also hard? Exactly. All soft, soft objects are also hard at a, after a certain point. Take the softest pillow you can think of. Right? If you keep pushing, there comes a point where it can no longer give way. So what does it mean to say that it no longer gives way? Your hardness receptors are going to be triggered. 
Yeah, so if you take, say, the, the skin here, there's a certain point at which your hardness receptors are going to be triggered. Right? But if you take bone, that's going to be triggered much earlier. Whereas if you take muscle, it's going to be triggered at some point. So all soft things are also hard after a certain point. What that means is the red receptors or the softness receptors are triggered earlier on, but the green receptors or the hardness receptors are also triggered a little further in. So the moment the hardness receptors are, 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 are triggered, now the brain thinks that it's a hard object. See, this sensation that you perceive, it's only a sensation in the mind. There is no such thing called hardness or softness. It's only the way that the mind interprets. A, a good example of this, not an example but more, more an analogy, is, is when someone says, I love you. Just think of that, just reflect on that for a second. When someone says, I love you, what does that mean? You know, whenever you feel love, what does that mean? Is that something that has been conveyed from the outside? Can someone ever give you love? I'm talking about the feeling of love. Right? When you look at your child and you feel love towards your child. When you look at your friend and you feel love towards your friend. Right? You look at your spouse and you feel love towards him or her. That's, that feeling of love is all homemade, isn't it? It's not something that they can ever give you. So when you say, I know you love me because you show me love. Th that is not true because love is not something that can be shown. It's only ever something that is created in the mind. So, you know, you know that that sensation, that feeling of love is a complete fabrication of the mind. So what does love feel like outside? What, what is love like outside? You, you can't answer that question because it does not exist outside. It's only a mental fabrication. So then tell me what about softness? The feeling of softness. When, when, you, when, you, when you hold or press against your skin, your muscle, and it feels soft, right? Or it feels cold when you, when you hold a, a cold surface. The feeling of coldness is not something that exists outside. It's only a perception of the mind. The feeling of hotness is only a perception of the mind. Hotness does not exist outside. There is no such thing called heat. It's a, it's a mental fabrication. But we measure energies, of course. You know, we have something called heat energy. Heat energy is vibrational energy. It's not, heat energy does not, does not feel hot. You know, that's just a vibrational energy. So an, an atom, as it vibrates, right, that is energy. That energy is picked up by what we call heat, re heat receptors in your skin. And then when those receptors pick up those sensations, it conveys it down a, down a neuron into your brain and you pick it up as heat. You perceive it as heat. So you see, that's how touch works. Softness, hardness, coldness, heat. All these things are perceptions of the mind. We talked about taste just a moment ago. These are simply molecules, molecular shapes and receptors and when the two of them come together, those receptors are triggered. Right? So taste does not exist in the outside world. It's only your perception of molecular shapes. The funny thing is this, folks. Both your tongue and your nose pick up the same thing. Don't you see how silly that is? But you perceive them in two different ways. I mean, I mean if, that's, if that's not madness, I don't know what is. Just, just think about it. It makes me laugh even talking about it. I, I, let me show you how, tongue, how, how taste works, okay? Here's your tongue. And this is how nose works. Here's your nose. Over here, you have a certain receptor. It's this shape. Here also you have a receptor. It's also the same, the same shape. Now, for something to fit into this, you need an object that is of this shape. Okay? So what do we have? Receptors and a molecular shape. When this comes into contact with this receptor, you experience taste. The same molecule. Do I need to complete this sentence? before you realize you're crazy. <laughs> the same molecule, when it fits into this receptor, 
You say, it smells nice. <laughs> so which one is this, <laughs> taste or smell? Come on, think it through. So which one is this, taste or smell? Can you explain that a little bit? Yes, certainly. We have receptors. Receptors are molecular shape receptors. Okay? Receptors are molecular shape receptors. These molecules, they have shapes. Right? And those shapes are determined by how atoms come together and the bonds and the hydrogen bonds and the covalent bonds and the ionic bonds and all sorts of things, right? So those who've done chemistry, if you remember any of it, you'll know that all molecules have a particular shape, right? So water has this shape. That's the shape of a water molecule. All molecules have shapes. That's what we call a molecular shape. These molecular shapes can be picked up by receptors which can either take in the entire molecule or part of it. Let's say this molecule had something like a, a, this, this, this sort of shape. Okay? Take that for instance. This is a molecule and it has this shape. Can this shape not fit into this? It can, because part of it can. As long as it's enough to trigger this nerve ending, that's all is required. Of course, if, you, if, if this part fits into this, this the, 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 the circular part, it won't work. If the square part fits into this, it won't work. But if this comes in and fits in exactly with the triangular part falling into this receptor, this nerve ending is going to be triggered. Now you have an electrical impulse. That's what you get. That's what neurons do. They convey electrical impulses. Now, if the same molecular shape, okay, let's say this one had this kind of receptor. So I throw it the other way around. This way. Okay, let's put it this way. So here's a receptor. Now the same molecule, if you pick it up, turn it around, and now this part of it, the circular part, that comes and fits in here. This is the same molecule, okay? Here, it's the same molecule. This fits in here, this part fits in there. Is that the nose? That's a nose. Does it not look like one? <laughs> no, it so this, this is the nose, and this is the tongue. Okay? Now tell me, think, the, think, think this through. When this nerve ending is triggered, it sends a signal to the brain to what we call the taste center. This nerve cell, it sends a signal to the brain to what we call the smell center. Okay? Now these are merely impulses, electrical impulses. If, for instance, this being the brain and all, Yes, the brain. Say this was the smell center and this was the taste center in the brain. Okay? So this neuron ends here. This one ends up here. Okay? So this is your taste center. This is your smell center. What would happen if we were to swap these two? Now we do, this is brain surgery. Right? We take this nerve and we slice it and fit it here. This one, we divert it and put, plug it to the taste center. What do you think is gonna happen? Now, when this, this shape comes into contact with your tongue, you smell something. When this shape comes into contact, the same shape comes into contact with your nose, you taste something. So, what was this then, smell or taste? Was this a smell or was it a taste? Hmm? It was neither. It's neither. It's neither smell nor taste. Is it perception? Smell and taste are perceptions. It's simply the way that you, your mind interprets molecular shapes. They are shapes. They're not tastes or smells. So what does that tell you when you experience smells and tastes and then you attach yourselves to them? So if you say that I like cake because it tastes great, what, huh? 
makes no sense because taste has, sorry, cake has no taste. Cake has no smell. A jasmine has no smell. A jasmine does not smell like jasmine. But we like joysticks, don't we? And you like it when the whole room smells nice. What's really going on there? All that's going on is the, uh, the fragrant stuff that the, the, the joystick is made of, right? as you light it, it, yes, it starts releasing, it, it diffuses into the air, and then the air carries those molecules up your nose. In your nose, you have some, off the top of my head, I think about, your nose is receptive to, don't quote me on this number, I'll check it for next week, about 10,000 odd different smells, because it's a various combination of, of, of different smells. In other words, they're not actually picking up smells, it's picking up shapes. These shapes are triggering nerve endings, which are then conveying those electrical signals to your brain, and then what your mind is doing is further interpreting those signals as tastes and smells. Your mind is a fabulous piece of equipment which can interpret things in ways that are mental. Mental because they don't actually exist out there. My problem is not that. It's not that you interpret those things as smells and tastes and touch and sight and so on. My problem is when you attach yourself to those sights and sounds, smells, tastes and touch, if you think that they are relayed to you, given to you from the object, now you, are, you form a bond with the object because you think it's the object that is giving me so much so many sights, so many sounds, smells, taste, and touch, when the object is actually not giving you anything at all. An object cannot give you any of those things. These are purely perceptions of the mind. If anything, you should fall in love with your mind, not the object. Because the mind's doing all the hard work, right? The mind is interpreting it and doing all the hard work of creating something from nothing. It really is. It's creating something from nothing. It's magic. That's why they call Vijnana is a wizard, it's a magician, <clears throat> it's an illusionist, it creates illusions. Now don't you see why it's an illusion? The, the Vijnana is an illusionist because it creates smells. Where do smells exist? They don't exist outside, but it creates smells. What about tastes? They don't exist, but it creates tastes, see? That's what, that's what an illusionist does, it creates illusions. Vijnana is an illusion. Problem is, when you create these illusions in the mind, if you think that these, what you perceive through your illusions are actually delivered to you from the objects, now you form a bond with the object. That's why you love your wife. Sorry. That's why you love your girlfriend. That's why you like her, at least. If you like what she looks like, you say, I, I, you know, she's very pretty. What does that mean? What's pretty? You say, I like, I like, you know, I like, I like, she's fair, I like fair color, she's dark, I like dark. What is black and white? These are only creations on the mind. If you like her rosy cheeks, what's rosy about her cheeks? If you like her red lips, what's red about her lips? All that's out there is part of Yapotejo Vayu. These are the four basic elements. The four basic elements are there, no lips are there. <clears throat> she doesn't have lips. It's just the four basic elements. If you want to take a scientific look at it, there's just high car carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Where are the lips? These are merely protein molecules, aren't they? These are proteins. Where are the lips, I ask you? Show me your lips. Your boyfriend loves your lips. Okay, now show me your lips. <laughs> your boyfriend likes your hair. Show me your hair. He says he loves, he loves your eyes. Show me your eyes. All you have are protein molecules. Those protein molecules are particular shapes. Right? And if you, if, you, if you expand a protein molecule, you have carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens. These are the things that make up your protein molecules. That's all you have. You don't have lips. But here's what the mind does. When the mind opens the eye that is its slave, it picks up light signals. These are energies. 
bouncing off carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and nitrogens, bouncing off, bouncing off carbohydrates, bouncing off lipids, bouncing off proteins, bouncing off keratin, which is what your hair is, bouncing off your skin, which is also just, you know, it's just dead skin cells. This is what, this is what light does. It just bounces off things. And then the eye picks up. It does not pick up color. The eye does not pick up color because there is no such thing called color. These are just electromagnetic waves, vibrations again. And then it sends that signal to your brain. Your brain interprets it with the help of the mind. So this is where Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vinyana happens. It interprets these light rays as colors. And then it doesn't stop there. Individual dots of color, it merges together. It merges them together. That's why you don't, you know, when you look at someone or something, you don't just see individual dots, right? You don't see individual elements of color. You actually see, you know, proper objects. That is only possible because your mind is constantly weaving them together. Individual data points, it's weaving them together to create information. So your mind is a supercomputer. It's taking in bits of data constantly and weaving them together to create information. So when you look at something, you think it's, it's an object. We talked about contrast a moment ago. The reason that you see that there are lips on your face is because there's a contrast in color. If, if my face was the same color as my lips, then my whole face would be lips. You wouldn't see lips here. The reason that you are able to identify this as a different part of my body to this part of my body is because there's a contrast in color. So all you see are, mentally, you see colors. What gives you this information that these are lips and this is the face? That's your drushti. It's knowledge that you have. See, let me ask you this question. I want you to think about it before you give me an answer. Is this a pen that you are seeing? Or is what you are seeing a pen? Think about it. Let me ask the question again. Is this a pen that you are seeing? Or is what you are seeing a pen? What you're seeing is a pen. It's not the pen that you see. What you see has become the pen. This is not a pen. <laughs> I've gone nuts, haven't I? This is not a pen. You've never seen a pen. Your mind is constantly weaving all this information. Not this information, the information that it's receiving right now. It's weaving, you know, all it's receiving is dots of color, isn't it? As you open your eyes and you look at this object, dots of color, in your mind, you're weaving these pieces of data together so fast that you're able to tell that this is a cap and this is the body. But how do you know that this is a cap and this is the body? You tell me. Because of contrast. Yes, as, like the good lady said earlier, this is the contrast that you see. It's because of this contrast, now you think that this has to be a different part to this. So now you go back to your memory banks and you ask yourself the question, this is a different part to this, what are these parts? You have it, you've learned this, that if this, is, this, this shape has to be a pen. You've learned this, haven't you? You've learned it. And so now you know that this is a cap and this is a body. See, you're projecting the knowledge that you have onto whatever is out here. Because it conforms to your, to your model, you're projecting the model. It's like you're casting a net. You're projecting your model, and then this fits your model. And therefore you say, this is a pen. Let me show you that. Now if I put this to you, this is not a full pen because it's missing a cap. Now you'll say, this is a, this is a pen without a cap. Because in your mind, you know that a pen has to have a cap. Says who? This is your knowledge. This is acquired knowledge. You, you have knowledge that a pen has to have a cap. If you walk up to your car today and there's no steering wheel, then you open the door, you sit in, and there's no steering wheel. Don't you feel like something's wrong? Why? 
Says who? What, what's wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with it. But don't you feel that something's wrong with it? Why is that? Because you have knowledge that a car must have a steering wheel. So now you project that image onto this object and you say something's wrong. Something's missing. No, nothing's missing. It's complete. It's perfect. <laughs> nothing's missing. Everything is perfect in this world. But the moment you make your projections onto the outside world, now there are things that are missing. Here's a man. Yes? What's the problem? Ah, says who? This is just part of the Abhote Jovai. I really understand this, pro this point, please, folks. I'm, I'm trying to help you come out of your suffering. <laughs> what's missing about this? What's, what's actually here? The four basic elements, right? Patavi, Apo, Tejo, and Vayu. Now, just, just think of it this as Patavi, Apo, Tejo, Vayu, and tell me what's missing. <laughs> what's missing? Nothing is missing, right? Okay, now, take that data, in, put it into your information model that you have in your mind, and now tell me what's missing. A leg is missing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 of course. I'm trying to make a different point here. Okay? What I'm trying to say is, in the world out there, these problems that you have, like a leg is missing, a limb is missing, those problems don't exist in the, in the world out there. It's a it's where your projection, you're projecting this. You're projecting a complete picture of a human being which has to have another one here. That's how you say, you know, this man, you'll say, is disabled because he only has a stump. You'll say, this man is incomplete. Now, if you were like this, wouldn't you be embarrassed a little bit? Don't mean to offend anyone. Okay? I gave you the warning at the beginning, right? Aren't people offended if they have, let's say, you know, these are the five fingers that is supposed to be on one's hand, but they only have four. Think of this as just patavi apo teja vayu. Now what's missing? What's missing? Nothing's missing. But think of this as a hand. Now what's missing? The fifth finger. <laughs> Who says this is a hand? Who says this is a hand? You say it's a hand. So then, where is the missing part? It's in your model. That's where it's missing. Now you project that deficiency onto the outside world object and you suffer as a result of that. This man is not suffering one bit. <laughs> He's not. Just imagine you were, you were born, right? You were born with only four digits. Okay? Just imagine you were born with four digits. You know when you're going to start suffering? <clears throat> hmm. The day you realize everyone else at home has five digits. Until then, you don't suffer. Until then, you only think, you know, you were born like this. Your problem? No problem. But then your mother comes to pick you up, to carry you. Your father comes to cuddle you, and then you see him like that. Then you look at yours, oh God, where's my fifth digit? Now you start to suffer. Why? Now you're projecting. Because now you have just acquired knowledge that this is supposed to be a hand, and a hand is supposed to have five fingers. I only have four. What, is, what only has four? Paravya Apotejavai only has four? No, a hand has four. Where's the hand? What's this? Just the four basic elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, if you want to put it that way, or the four basic elements, if you want to interpret it in the way that the Buddha explained the, four, the, 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 the physical world out there. Physically, this is complete. There's nothing wrong with it. No inadequacies, no deficiencies. See? Now, if you, if you have whatever physical, if you think something's physically wrong with you, right? say you have a if you have an extra digit, now there are some people who have six digits. 
Some might have a shorter finger than, than, than the rest of them. Some might have, a, let's say, uh, they've got a lump somewhere. Okay? Some might have a crooked back. Some might have uh, an extra ear. I don't know, I'm making things up. Right? Some might not have uh, all the, all, you know, some might have a missing tooth or, you know, a whole set of teeth. Right? Some might have an extra tooth. Right? See, no matter what it is, you define your adequacies, inadequacies, and deficiencies because of the projection that you, that you make in your mind. This is a mental process. This is a mental process. Physically, the world is complete as it is. I'm not talking about the Vipaka that made this guy not have a limb. That's not what I'm talking about here. Vipaka is always perfect. Vipaka is always perfect. This is just part of the Apo Tejo Vayu. That's all it is. It's just matter. Do you think any of these elements in the body, any of these oxygens or carbons or hydrogen, any of these hydrocarbons or any of these molecules in the body know that it's part of a body? Do you? No. Do you think the proteins know that they're part of a human body? No. So who knows that this is part of a body? Only those who do. This is not a body in that sense. This is just matter. But you project a body onto this because you want this to be a body. You interpret this as a body because of your own knowledge. Now you suffer. Here's why you suffer. Because you take this all as one entity. See, what you have is part of your apotejo vayu. But you connect them and you create this entity, this entity that it's a human body. And once you create this human body of an entity, now you say this part is missing, that part is missing, because that entity is created in your mind. It does not exist out here. And when you create an entity in your mind, it is always influenced by the drushti that you have. Let's go through that again. Whenever you create an entity, remember entities are only created in the mind. Okay. Whenever, because it's the mind that creates entities, the mind is always at risk of being influenced by the drushti that it has. Then here's the problem. Because the mind is always influenced by the drushti that it has, whenever it creates an entity, it doesn't simply take the object as is. It creates that entity and it weaves it with all of the drushti that, that it has to come with it. So therefore, when you create an entity out of this, you try to identify what this is. Because, you know, an entity has to have an identification, doesn't it? Not, I don't necessarily mean the name pen. I don't mean the label, the pen, okay? You might know this as an entity even without knowing it's called a pen. It's still okay. Imagine you were seeing this pen for the first time in your life. You were seeing a pen for the first time in your life. You would know this is called a pen. But it's still an object. You would still identify it as an object. As you identify this as an object, it will be now an unknown object, okay? As you identify this object, now you are going to learn about this object. You want to learn about this object. So you go through the Rupa, you go through the Vedana, you go through Sanya, you go through Sankara, right? And now you create this object. Then it becomes an entity in your mind because of ignorance and attachment. The moment you ent entitify this object, now you have a mental description of this. It's formed, it, it is influenced by drushti. Right now you don't know it's called a pen. Okay, but you acquire knowledge about it. You ask someone, what is this thing called? They say it's a pen. Okay, then you take it up and you, you pull these pieces apart. Ah, oh, okay, it has a clip, it has a nib, it has a barrel, it can write. See, now you're, you're picking up, acquiring knowledge about a pen. But what's really in my hand? The four basic elements. All I have in my hand are the four basic elements and a combination of them. Is it supposed to be able to write? Is this supposed to be able to write? No. <laughs> the four basic elements, are you supposed to be able to write with it? No. But once it becomes a pen in your mind, now you have to be able to write with it. You, shouldn't, you need not be able to write with the four basic elements. They're just the four basic elements. That's it. But if you interpret the, this as a pen, and how does that happen? This is where vijnana becomes vijnana skanda. You interpret when you open your eyes individual dots of data. right? So initially you only see the sight. And then you come and pick it up. Now you know it has a weight. And you know how hard this is. See, all of this, you're... you're 
augmenting the pieces of the data that you have in your mind. You're augmenting them. You're, you're, you're compounding them, all fitting it into one bag. You have in your mind a bag that's called a pen bag. It's not a bag of pens. I mean, it's a bag into which you put all of the data that you collect about a pen. This never existed until you, you asked this very first question, what is this? And someone said, it's a pen. From that day on, every time you touched a pen, you put in data into this. If you could, you, could, you would lick it. You know, some people, they put the pen in the mouth. Right? Now, those people, they know what a ten, pen tastes like. I don't, because I don't do that. <laughs> some do. Right? So they know what a pen tastes like. So when you put that in your mouth and, you, and you, 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 I don't know, you suck on it or whatever, now that data goes into this bag. So this is what a pen is supposed to taste like. This is what a pen feels like. This is what a pen smells like. This is what a pen smells like. There's no such thing. All there is is the four basic elements. This always was the four basic elements. This always will be the four basic elements and simply a combination of those elements. But in your mind, you merge all this information together. You merge all this information together. You augment, you, you, you compound all these pieces of information together and in your mind you create an entity called a pen. Now when you look at this object, you go into your bag, in your mental bag, there are lots of bags. Each of these bags, they call, they call entities. So when, you, when I present an object to you, what you do is you go into one of those entity bags, you go into the entity room, right? You open the entity room and in your mind you have lots of different bags. In those bags you have cats and dogs and husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and pens and pencils and mangoes and chimpanzees. You have all sorts of things. So now what you do is you put your, your hand into one of them. It, it all depends on what this triggers, okay? So when you look at this, you don't think chimpanzee. You, because this has a trigger. When you dip into your mental, you, you go into that mental entity room, you take this Vipaka object, you take this Vipaka object, you go into the mental room of entities and you go and look in those bags and find one that is the best fit for this. Remember what you bring back is not a Vipaka, what you bring back is an entity. Then you bring back the entity and you put it against this Vipaka and you say, oh, the clip is missing. Because in that entity room, there was a pen, a pen bag. What you picked out of that, it has a pen, it has a clip. You bring it back and you project it on this. Now, it is a pen without a clip. Because you know that it's supposed to have a clip. What about an arahant then? Doesn't an arahant know that a pen should have a clip? Of course they do. They do. What they don't have is an expectation that a pen should have a clip. They know. Because they also have a room. These are simply called namagotha. In fact, they're called, they're not entity rooms. They're memory banks or memory rooms. In those memory rooms, they also have pens, but they're not entities. In other words, they don't come with an expectation that this should all be one package. That they don't have. These are merely elements manifesting as pens and pencils and this, that and the other. Simply manifestations. But when someone who is a non-arahant, someone who has no dhamma, when you go into your rooms, you have rooms of entities. When you see this vipaka, this becomes an entity in your mind. So actually you take a, cre a fully formed entity out here and you go into the entity room to check which one fits with this. Okay? Uh, let me explain that to you again. When I present this object to you, when I present this object to you, a vipaka process kicks off in your mind, right? So this becomes the rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, and vijnana happens. This is the panchadwara vajjana chitta viti. In other words, this is merely your five senses doing its slave work for the mind. It's picking up this vipaka object because the, there's the mind waiting for this information from the eyes, okay? When I say the eyes, I don't mean the physical eyes. I mean the process that is related to how the, how the eye relays information to the mind. Because ultimately the mind is, the, is where all the magic happens. The, eye, the mind is where all the magic happens, but it is making use of the eye. It's making use of the eye. And this is all a vipaka process. I haven't got to the karma process yet. In the vipaka process, 
there comes a rupa. So we have the pen. Vedana, Sanya, Sankara and Vijnana takes place. Now, now you're an arahant at this point. Okay, you're just an arahant at this point. You have a chakkuncha paticca rupa chupajjati, chakku vijnana, by which you have simply seen a manifestation of a pen. This is merely a manifestation at that point. But remember, this process is run on a base that is ignorant and attached. In other words, to entities. Although that is the vipaka process, parallel to the vipaka process, you have a karma process that is running. This is run because of ignorance and attachment. So you can draw them parallelly. So this is all triggered by a sight, the sight of the pen. This object has been now become the rupa. Vedana, Sanya, Sankara and Vijnana, whether you're an arahant or not, it's the same process. So this blue that you see is blue, the same blue to an arahant. Unless the eye, there are defects in the eye or changes in the eye, neurons, right? The, the physical environment. If the physical environment is the same, if the light that falls on this, the ambient light, you know, if all that is the same, I present this to, to one who is an arahant, to one who is a non-arahant, they both see the same thing. They both see the same color, exactly the same color. Because same causes, same effect. No difference there. But this is, although this is the vipaka process, you have an ignorance and attachment process or a karma process that runs parallelly. So what happens when you have the karma process? This rupa, you have abhisankara. Meaning, the rupa becomes an entity in the mind. We haven't gone into the entity room yet. Okay? This is where the vipaka process is still happening. This rupa becomes an entity. So now this is an entity of a rupa. Meaning, the mind ignores the fact that this is a manifestation, it takes the rupa as, as, as a unit, as one, 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 one element, one piece. Same thing goes for Vedana, same thing goes for Sanya, same thing goes for Sankara, same thing goes for Vijnana. So by the point you see the pen, now this has become an entity of a pen. Okay? Remember, this is the karma process, this is the vipaka process. But these two things run parallelly. Next up, is to go into the entity room. Now you have to go into the entity room because this is the this this happens this part happens through vipaka, karma is going on here. Now you have to you have to go you, the the mind now has work to do. The mind has work to do to do with dhamma. This this has happened with the the chitta sorry, the eye to do with rupa. The eye did this part with rupa. Of course, the mind was there that, was, that had ignorance and that was running parallelly. But now, having taken this input, now the mind has work to do alone. Now, for the, from here on, you don't need the eye. The mind now has to do this with the Dhamma. So for that, the mind can simply isolate itself from the other five senses. Because every time you see an object, ladies and gentlemen, you have a billion chitta processes that go. A minimum of three, a maximum of I don't know how many. An infinite number of chitta processes that run where the mind is constantly analyzing, reflecting, contemplating, checking, balancing with all the dhamma that it has acquired. Because the, 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 you know, it has access to an infinite pool of data. An infinite pool of data. It can even imagine things. So now the mind dips in to this room where it has entities. It's entity room. So what the mind does now is it takes this image, this this mental impression goes into it, the memory, the uh, entity room, and in there you have the Paricca Samupada process. The Paricca Samupada process which does Vijnana Pachya Nama Rupa. Right? Nama comes from memory, the Nama Gotta, and Rupa is what the mind creates as an entity with the help of that Nama. Okay, so the mind creates a rupa with the help of that nama. So nama is Vedana Sanya. The rupa, the mind creates with the help of that nama. And now in this entity room are all entities. So what the mind does now is it brings back an entity. Having taken this into this room, it brings back an entity. That entity is purely mental. It's all created in the mind. 
Of course, influenced by previous memories, facts it has learned about things that look like this, things that weigh like this, things that share, you know, taste like this, and so on. And now it does a comparison. It does a comparison. This is where sampasa happens. And then once you have sampasa, now you have a comparison. This is the object that came from the outside. This is the object that you got from the entity room. Now you have the Vedana. Why? Because you have a comparison. If these two are, ma are a match, you have Sukha Vedana. If these two are a mismatch, you have Dukkha Vedana. If it's still questionable, now you have Upeksha Vedana. Still uncertain which way to go. We'll talk about this later on another day in more detail. What I'm trying to really the gist of this is to help you understand that the mind is dealing with entities here because the mind is ignorant. The mind has no Dhamma. The mind that is without the Dhamma sees the world as entities and therefore even when presented with a Vipaka, which is merely a manifestation, right, you project your entity that you got from your entity room. Remember this is, folks, there is no such thing called a pen in the outside world. All of this is part of the Apotejo Vayu. A pen is a creation of the mind. Remember, when, you, when the mind creates something, it has access to all the information that it has. Because it's a mind after all. Where do memories exist? Does, it, is, is, does memory exist in a pen? Look at, think about this for a second. Now here you have these markings, don't you? Hmm? You bought this, from, when you bought it from the shop, it had all these markings on it. That you put into your memory. Over time, this marking it gets, it gets rubbed off and it, you know, it, it comes off. Say two years later, you look at this pen and now you say the markings come off. Okay? You say that you know, you used to have this marking, it had expo on it, but now it's not there. How are you able to make this comparison? Because you have it in your memory. Memory of what? Memory of? A pen. You have a memory of a pen. Why do you have a memory of a pen? Because they are entities. Your mind creates an entity when it puts stuff into your memory banks. So you have memories, you have memories of entities. So therefore in the present, the mind doesn't have, you know, it's like this, this entitification happens in the present moment. Okay, so even when we talk about memories, the mind puts these mental images that it, that it, that it perceives into its memory, but they become entities when the mind withdraws from that. When the mind pulls back memories, at that point they become entities. What I'm trying to explain to you is the reason that you see, if, if there was part of this missing, ah, let's take a leaf, it'll be easier to explain this. I, I showed this to you right now at the beginning. And you say, okay, that's a leaf, that's good. Now this goes into memory, okay? Now I showed this to you again later, and now this part of the leaf is gone. So now you say that this is not complete because half of this is missing. This is happening because in your memory, you have this. That's, there's nothing wrong with that because an arahant can also tell the same, okay? But when you create this in your mind right now, you create a leaf because I'm not actually presenting a leaf to you. All I'm presenting to you is patavi, apo, tejo, vayu, the four basic elements. That's what I have in my hand. But your mind pieces all these bits of data together and creates a leaf. Yes, you create a leaf. How do you know this is a real leaf and not a fake one? Or shall I ask another way? How do you know this is a fake one, not a real one? Which one is it? Fake or real? You don't have that information yet. So when you look at what about these flowers? Are they fake or real? What are you relying on? Are you relying on what comes through your eyes? Or are you relying on your mind doing all the math mathematics, the analysis, the content? Is the mind doing that, isn't it? So the mind tells you this is real and that is fake. But couldn't you be fooled? You could, yeah? Of course. 
you get full. I mean, that's, that's the name of the game. You're always fooled. <laughs> so when you look at these flowers, you could be fooled. In fact, I could have just fooled you. I, I'm saying this is a real leaf, but could I not actually tear a fake leaf? It's still possible. Right? But your mind thinks that this is a real leaf because of data that you have. It's not here. I'm not showing you that. All I have is part of your apothe jawayu. This fakeness and realness are all creations of your own mind. But don't you pay extra for real flower decorations when you have a wedding or something? Yeah? You always pay extra for that. Why? If it's fake flowers versus real flowers, what's the difference in the flower? Aren't they the four basic elements? So why do you pay extra for real flowers? Exactly. Thank you, madam. I'm glad it's not I who said that. <laughs> Because when you see those four elements, your mind likes, your mind gives value to the authentic object. It likes, it likes real flowers. Why, why is that? Drushti. Because you've heard it from other people. You know, to make you think that something's more valuable, all the, all the, 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 uh, the salesman has to do is put the price up. Now you think it's more valuable than the other one. Don't, don't they? I, I have a fake leaf and I have a real leaf. Right? These, one is fake and one is real. Okay? One is 500, the other is 1,000. Which one do you think is now more valuable? The one that is, that is 1,000, right? Says who? Why did you believe my word? I am the one who said that one's 500, the other is 1,000, and now you think that the 1,000 one is more, somehow of more value. Just because I put a higher number on it, a higher price on it. What if I got it wrong? I put the label on the wrong one by mistake. Now which, now which one's more valuable? <laughs> it was by mistake. I actually made a genuine mistake and put the label, label on the wrong one. No? Aren't there times where you go, you go shopping and you pick things up and you think, oh, that's a bargain. You take it to the till and then go, sorry, lo wrong label? <laughs> no, we, that was mispriced. And then you start complaining. Well, if it's that price, I have to get it at that price. How dare you? I have, if you put the price on, now I want to buy it. Hmm? So... <laughs> No, how, how come then, you know, you see, these values that we assign to things are all mental. That's why gold to you might be more valuable than silver. Says who? Who says gold is more valuable than silver? What does gold do to you that silver doesn't? Does it put you, put you to bed at night? Does it sing you a lullaby? What does gold do to you that silver doesn't? Think about it. Why is gold more precious than silver? Why are diamonds more, more precious than, than gold? And now you'll say because one's more scarce than the other. Not so. There's more gold in this world than there are diamonds. I beg your pardon. There's, gold is actually rarer than diamonds. Did you know that? Gold is rarer than diamonds. But the price for diamonds is artificial. They've created an economy where diamonds are, 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 are priced higher than, than gold is. But if you take the, the whole world and all the, the, if you, uh, the, uh, the, the actual world that we live in, diamonds are more in abundance than, than gold. Gold is much more rare than, than diamond is. But diamonds have more value than gold. Says who? Simply because they put a higher price on it. So therefore now when you want to give a gift to someone, you feel that you are giving them more love by giving them a diamond rather than giving them gold. Madam? So, actually nothing exists in this world, is that Oh, <laughs> that's the million dollar question. <clears throat> I'm, not say, I'm not saying that nothing exists in this world, okay? So that's where we have to draw a line. What exists in this world are the four basic elements. You know, we can talk about, we can say that all there is in this world is energies. All there is is energy. There is condensed energy, energy that is more concentrated. Right? Then there is energy that is less concentrated, like more spread about. When we say something's a, something's a hard object, there's more energy concentrated. So there's a higher density of energy here. When something's soft, like the air, right? there's less density of energy there. That's at the very, very basic level. If you take one step further, you can say what there is is part of the Apo Tejo Vayu. 
right? One of these days we'll go into more detail as to why it's called Patavi, why it's called Tejo, why why, why, and so on. Not really relevant to understanding the Dhamma, but it simply gives us an understanding of how the world is constructed and what's really out there. So the four basic elements, they are there. The thing is this though, how do we know that the four basic elements are there when you can't perceive them? You see, I present to you the four basic elements, but you see a sight, don't you? You're seeing color. I didn't present color to you. So how do you know that the four basic elements are here? You're going to have to take my word for it. You have to take the Buddha's word for it on that aspect. Because there is something here. What we don't know is whether there is sight here. Well, actually, we know that there is no sight here. Because, you know, as you put your hand on it, you come into contact with something, right? I admit, I agree, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are thinking this already, so I'll say it out loud. But this physical touch is also a sensation, isn't it, Swami answer. So how can you say whether this is actually exists? Yeah, I, I know, I know. <laughs> I know what you like. So how can you actually say that this exists? That's what I'm saying. You're going to have to take my word for it, not my word for it, his word for it, that the four basic elements are there. You know, this can only be perceived by the mind that has the wisdom of what you call the anavarna jnana. It is not something that anyone besides the Buddha can actually, can actually tell you. So then you might wonder, well, how do we attain Nibbana if we have to take what the Buddha says by blind faith? Should we just take it just because he says so? How does, how does one get to Nibbana like that? I thought, I thought Buddhism was scientific. I thought Buddhism makes, makes sense. This is a problem you'll have. The deal is this. You are not attached to the four basic elements, so who cares? Sir? The only reason that we have science and Buddhism as two different philosophies, two different schools of study, is because science is still working its way towards Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy. The day that these two things are the same, you will not, no longer have something called science and Buddhist philosophy, because you don't need two things that do the same thing, right? If this is a pen, why call this another name? If they both do the same thing, they just call them all pens. So as the gentleman says, right, science is beginning to understand that what seems real is not real. But, you know, this kind of science, not the Rupa Vedana Sanya stuff, the, the, the fact that there is no color has been proven by science. Science accepts that there is no such thing called color. But there are pigments. What pigments do is not give us color. What pigments do is they reflect light waves. Not light waves, really, you can call them light waves, electromagnetic waves. We call it light waves because it falls within a particular spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum. These are the waves that are sensitive, that the, the, that the rods and the cones in the eyes are sensitive to. You know, we see some waves in the spectrum, other animals see another spenders of the spectrum. So how do we now say that there are no such thing called devas and brahmas and spirits and demons and so on? Just because we can't see them, how do we say that they don't exist? See, once you begin to realize that this is the way the world is, you know, we are simply a series of causes and effects. Our limited view of the world, you know, is actually very, very limited. We see very little, we know very little about the world out there. Now, therefore, it is unreasonable to actually cast judgments about what is there and what is not there. Even when what you think is there isn't there, after all. Right? Even when you, th well, all the things you've been thinking throughout your lives, you thought your mother was there. But now you're beginning to understand that there is no such thing. You've got to take this the right way. Because if you think there's no mother, then you go stab someone and you say, well, no, that is not a sin. Why, is that, why should that be a sin? I haven't stabbed my mother because there's no such thing called a mother. Remember, sins and merits, they, are also, they also happen only in the mind that has no dhamma. That's why an arahant does not commit sins, an arahant does not commit merits. So, merits and sins, they're both done in the mind because of intention. When the mind has no dhamma, the mind begins to entitify physical, entitify elements. See, what is theft after all? Think about this, I think if you understand this, you will understand the rest of it. Or at least you'll begin to. Theft, stealing. Why can an arahant not steal? We've spoken about this in the past, but I'm reminding you again because it's, it seems prudent to talk about it right now. 
Why can an arahant not do a sin? Why can an arahant not do theft? What is theft? Theft is taking something that belongs to someone else without their permission. Okay? What we have here are the four basic elements. Who does it belong to? In, the, in real absolute terms, who does these four basic elements belong to? No one. It doesn't belong to anyone. Because if you said it belonged to me, if I said this belonged to me, what am I? This body is the four basic elements, and the mind is simply a mind, but in the mind I think that I am I, myself, and I think that this object belongs to me. It's only a thought. I think. I think. It's my perception. Now just imagine I am an arahant. No, 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 cut that part. No, no. Very dangerous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's say you are an arahant, okay? You are all arahants, right? You are all arahants, so you don't feel that this pen belongs to you. But I think it belongs to you, right? And I want to take it without your permission. Now, I am committing theft in my mind. Theft is not really happening in the outside world. It's only in my intention. See, that is why Punya Papa Pahinas, who is an arahant, an arahant is incapable of committing theft because they don't perceive the world as, as belonging to anyone. Because there is no one to belong to. They understand that this is simply part of Yapo Tejo Vayu. You are also part of Yapo Tejo Vayu. And in addition, in addition to that, you're a mind. There's a mind there. Right? Mind is also an energy. So there's the physical energy, composition of energy as a physical body, and there's energy as a mind. That's all there is. Nothing belongs to anything. So if nothing belongs to anything, then how can taking this be theft? So theft does not happen out there. Theft only happens in, in my mind. But remember, when it happens in my mind, jati is going on in the mind. Because otherwise, how would there be entities? So because jati is going on in the mind, now there is theft and therefore karma is done. Now that karma then goes on to become your vipaka. So therefore, the karma of theft is happening and therefore the vipaka of theft would ensue. All of this happens in the mind. There is no such thing called theft in the, in the absolute terms. But if you steal, you're going, to get, you're going to go behind bars. Because in a conventional world that we live in, people see the world in a very conventional way. People see the world in a two-dimensional way. That is why we say, the minds that have no dhamma are crazy. I need you to understand this so that you can free yourself from suffering, that's all. If you are attached to the color green, you will always suffer because of that. See, I can make you suffer if you are attached to color, uh, the color green, simply by taking this away. Because you want to see green, I take it away. Now you suffer. Why do you, make, why do you leave it for me to be able to make you suffer? Why do you let me make you suffer? Hmm? Only because the Dhamma, you are lacking in the Dhamma. If you begin to understand that green is not, an, not something in the object, it's simply something that you perceive, right? Now, if it's not in the object, me taking the object away shouldn't bother you. I know you will say, of course, but Swaminath, if you take the object away, I can no longer see green. Yeah, you'd say that. I, I, you'll say, I understand, Swaminath, it's not in the pen, but the pen helps me to see green because if it, not, it was not for these pigments, how would I see green? Yes, but initially I'm telling you that it's not in the object, so therefore you don't need to have an association with the object. Your mind is only attached to green. But remember, we've always talked about how pleasure works in the mind, and that is through relief from vexation. You like to see green because you believe green brings you pleasure. But we've discussed this time and time again, that pleasure is simply relief from vexation. It is not something that green brought you or blue brought you, or red brought you, or any other object brought you. So now if you are armed with that knowledge as well, then you, you're not going to attach yourself to sights or sounds or smells or taste or touch, because you know that none of those experiences bring you pleasure. It's simply relief from vexation that brings you pleasure. So therefore, you are free of your attachment to those sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touch as well. Now you're not, so with that, you are no longer attached to the object, and you're no longer attached to the sensual 
uh, experience, now you're attached to nothing. So if you're attached to nothing, then why do you suffer? What, is, what cause is there to suffer? There is none whatsoever. That's why there is nothing to let go. Right from the very first sermon we've been talking about, this, not, there's nothing to let go. All you need to understand is, is that really, there is nothing to let go. <laughs> nothing is there to let go. So, nothing to let go. Don't let go of anything. Just understand that there is nothing you're attached to. I know I, words fail me because I, I say one thing, it, it could mean something completely different. When I say there is nothing to let go, what I mean is there is nothing that the mind has to let go because there are no such things called things. They're simply manifestations. They're only creations of, the own, of your own mind. So you don't need to let go of physical objects. You don't need to let go of any, any entities because there are no entities. But as you first start your making way in the Dhamma, making progress in the Dhamma, you might think, well, if I have to become a monk, if I have to become an Anagarika, should I let go of my, my house? Should I let go of my property? Should I let go of my wife? Should I let go of my children? Should I let go of my wealth? And all these things that I, belo- that own, that I own and that belong to me. No, what you need to do is understand that none of these things actually belong to you and none of these things are there in the first place. So now what are you attached to? See, I ask any mother here who might be attached to her child. Okay? Where's that child of yours that you're attached to? Where's the child that you're attached to? This is your child. What's here? The four? You just have the four basic elements. This is just part of the why. In addition to that, there's a chitta. That's just an energy. So where's the child? So what am I asking you to let go? What is there to let go? There's nothing to let go. Are you attached to the four basic elements? Can you be attached to the four basic elements? No, I mean, that's the point. <laughs> Get it? Can you be attached to the four basic elements, sir? You can't, because you have never perceived the four basic elements. The only thing you can be attached to are sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. These four basic elements never gave you any of those things. So let go of the object. So would it be good to contemplate on everything as the four basic elements? Absolutely, madam. Yes. If you, if you, whenever you are, when you get back home today, right? Take the first thing that you, you come across which you have a, a special attachment to, right? maybe an ornament or something that you, you really like, something that you're really attached to. Okay? Take it in your hand if you can and then tell yourself or ask yourself, what's really here in my hand? Is there sight here? Or does this object have sight or is sight this mental image simply that is forming, fabricating in my mind? If I'm attached to sight, it's not the sight of the object. It's just sight that's created in my mind. So therefore, it's not something that comes to me from the object. Right? Now it loses its value, one-fifth of it. Next. If you like the sound of it, that sound never came from the object. These are merely vibrations. These vibrations are picked up by your eardrums, converted into electrical signals, and the mind interprets them as sound. But if you're attached to the sound, it's not coming from the object. So therefore, the object never gave you sound. Two-fifths gone. Next, taste. Stick it in your, stick your tongue out and give it a good lick or two, right? And then ask yourself, that taste that I'm sensing, is it, is it in the object? It's not in the object. We've just talked about how receptors only take in complementary shapes. The same receptors, if they're, they're in your nose, very similar. The mechanism, mechanism is very similar. Those receptors placed in your nose, it, it appreciates smell. Those receptors in your tongue, it appreciates taste. So neither taste nor smell are in the objects. So therefore, these, these objects that you're attached to didn't give you smell and neither did it give you taste. Right? Three-fifths. Four-fifths gone. Finally, you're at touch. 
If you like the touch of it, now you know that this sensation of touch is not something that's coming from the object. If you like how warm it is, warmth is not something in the object. If you like how cold it is, coldness is not in the object. So when you take an ice cream and you lick it, you know, an ice cream is not cold. It's not. There are things called, called receptors in your, in your tongue and other parts of the body. There are things called heat receptors. Right? They simply take vibrational energy and they interpret in the mind as cold and heat. This is why chilies are hot. You, when you have a chili, it, see, it seems hot, doesn't it? Because what chilies do, there's, there's, a, there's a chemical compound in those chilies that actually trigger the same receptors in your body that pick up extreme heat. The same receptors. If this was the receptor on, the, on, the, on, your, on your body, the same receptors that pick up vibration energy from, a, from an object that is hot, these receptors also bind with molecules that... Should I pick a different shape? Also bind with molecules. These are hydrocarbons. They're called capsaicin. It's in, it's in chilies, it's in capsicums, that's how capsicums get their names, it's in garlics and so on. You know, th these receptors, they are receptive, they are stimulated by these molecules. And so therefore, when you eat chilies, or when you come into contact with chilies, they're there in all, all parts of your body, because the body has to protect itself from extreme heat. Why? Well, for its survival. Yeah? That's why you start sweating when you eat chilies. It's not because chilies are spicy. Spiciness is not something that exists in chilies. Those receptors which pick up heat are triggered. Now because these triggers go to your brain, now your brain thinks that you're on fire. So when your body starts heating up, what must the body do? You sweat, don't you? Why? To, to diffuse heat. That's why when you eat chilies, you start sweating. And then you say the food is spicy. The food is not spicy. <laughs> There's no such thing called spicy food, but don't you like spicy food? You think it comes from the food. It doesn't. All that's happening is there are molecules that come into contact with these receptors which, whose responsibility it is to pick up heat. Actually, no, it's not to pick up heat. It's, it's responsibility to pick up kinetic energy in the outside world and then translate that with the help of the brain into the sensation of heat. That's what happens. So chilies are not spicy. But you perceive them as spicy. Do you mean you eat something that's when you, when you eat ice cream, the sweet receptors, I mean, again, they're not sweet receptors, but they are shape receptors, right? They're all shape receptors. But things that we call sweet, they have a particular shape. That's why you have artificial sweetness. The receptors that... Uh, we're talking about sweet, right? So sweetness is not something that exists in food. These are receptors that are complementary to that shape, and that's why we have sweetness, artificial sweetness. You create an artificial sweetener by, by artificially creating the same shape as, say, a glucose molecule. Now, when you have eaten something spicy, one of the worst things you can do is drink water. But isn't that what we always do? There's a reason for that, because this, these molecules, these hydrocarbons, they don't dissolve in water. What they do is they just float in water. So when you put water into your mouth after you have eaten something spicy, what happens is those molecules, now they float everywhere. And whereas it was only at the tip of your tongue or say on one side of the tongue, now it's all over your mouth. That's why something better to do in those instances is drink something that is fatty. Maybe milk. Milk has fats in it. Ice cream. Ice cream does not soothe you because it's cold. Ice cream has fat in it. So what fat does is it dissolves that, those hydrocarbons and then you, know, you ingest it and so on. You can remove them from, from the tip of from, from your tongue, right? Or your, or your oral cavity. But water does not no such thing. Water simply, you know, they, those molecules just float in water. They don't dissolve in water. In fact, they, they, they're not, those compounds don't break down in water. They just float in water. So one of the worst things you can do when you've had something spicy is drink 
Drink water. But isn't that what we always do? It's better to drink some milk or take a lick of an ice cream. That's okay because it has fats. And fats, they're, they're soluble in fats. So what happens when you drink, uh, when you put something cold on, on, your, on your tongue, is your, there are cold receptors in your tongue. Those receptors start picking up the cold sensations, right? And now you have two types of signals going to your brain. There are the signals that, are, that have just been triggered that give heat, and there are the signals that have been triggered because you have put something cold. Again, I keep saying, put something cold. It's not the something that is cold, okay? Because coldness is something that you perceive in your mind. But you have both these stimuli that's going to the brain. And of course, the brain can only perceive one at one time. So when it starts taking the cold stimulus, stimuli, then that's going to be more prominent in the brain. And therefore, you start sensing that more so than the spicy stuff. That's what happens. And of course, after a while, those molecules that were triggering the heat receptors, you know, they disintegrate and they get dissolved in your saliva and, you know, they, you, you ingest them. And after a while, you know, they, they don't, because they don't stay there forever, they are washed down. So that's more a function of time than, than the actual uh, substance that you put on your tongue to, to soothe yourself. But in any case, what we need to get from this lesson, because I don't want this to be a science lesson, right? What I'm trying to get across to you is, how what you believe you're perceiving is not really out there. It's, it's pitiful then that if you attach yourself to the objects, you're, you're giving it more credit than it deserves because none of these objects are giving you any of those sensations. There is nothing that is of good taste, nothing that is beautiful, nothing that, is, that sounds good, there's nothing that smells good, there's nothing that feels good out there. All out there is just the four basic elements. That's why I ask you, if you have trouble giving up your son, if you think you're attached to your son, if you're attached to your daughter, if you're attached to your child, right? remember, if you can't give up your attachment while you're still alive, you're not going to do it after you're dead. You'll keep, com you'll keep coming back looking for your child. That's what's going to happen. So it's better to do it while you're still alive and while you still can. Once you're dead, no one's going to give you the Dhamma. Remember that, you know, your death is simply the chitta arising in a different body. That's all. I mean, you know, death is not as grand as you think it is. It's, not, it's nothing so magical, nothing so grand. If a chitta was, you know, when you get off your car and you get into get another one, it's exactly the same thing that happens. You're driving one car, get out of that car, get into another one and start driving. What's changed? Same driver, different car. Yeah? Same thing's going on. When you die, you come out of this body, you get into another body, and you, you now you're just another passenger in another car, that's all. The mind's wantings, desires are still the same. Remember, there are no live people and dead people. There are only two types of minds, one's with the Dhamma and one's, with, one's without. So, if you can't let go of your child now, it's because you think there is a child here. That's why you can't let go of them. What's really out here are the four basic elements. This is part of your apotheja. Why? Of course there's a chitta. You are never attached to the four basic elements because you've never perceived the four basic elements. But you like the sight of your child. You think he's so cute. You think he's so sweet. You like their smell. You like their taste. That sounds weird. You like their, their sound, right? You, you like whatever sensual sensations you can take from your child. But those things are not things that your child gave you. They're all creations of your mind. So if you're struggling as a mother or a father to give up your attachment to your child, I ask you the question, what are you really, what's really here to give up? What's there for you to, to be attached to? There is nothing. You're only creating a world in your own mind and you're attached to that. You are attached to a, your own creations. This child does not exist out here. It's only in your mind. This is, this is a product of various layers of augmentation. Various layers. These layers are all built up in the mind. Because what you can see are only sight elements. That's it. These are you know, merely colors. When you look at your child, how do you know you're looking at your child? What do you see? Colors, right? But why do you think that that is your child? Because those color elements, you have to keep adding up. There's a function that goes on in your mind. You keep adding them up, you keep augmenting them, collecting them, accumulating them, aggregating them, until it comes to a point where you say, that's my child. 
that is all mental. It's not, it's not out there, it's not physical. Out there is just the four basic elements. See, once you understand this, you, you, you realize there is nothing to let go of. Now, when you get home, right? Pick up something that you are attached to. So you can do this as a, as a bit of homework. Just pick up something you're attached to. Right? If you're attached to an ornament, you're attached to a piece of clo you know, some clothing, right? maybe it's a hat that you like or some flowers or maybe your pet cat. You know, pick up whatever you, you're attached to and go through this process. Ask these questions of, from yourself. What am I attached to? Right? This is your cat. Right? You can stroke it a few times so that it stays there. And after it, ask yourself, right, cat, what's here? Is there really a cat here? You like what it looks like. Right? You like the little whiskers that come out of its mouth. And then you, you like what it looks like. It's very fluffy, you might think. This is just the four basic elements. Is there a cat here to be attached to? If there's simply the four basic elements, and there's no color either, there's no smell here, there's no taste here, there's no touch here, these physical sensations that you're getting from your cat, they don't exist there. They're all creations in your mind. Now what do you have to do with this cat? What's your attachment to the cat? <laughs> all here are just the four basic elements. Let the cat go. I mean, don't kill the thing, just, just put, let it go. Because if you are attached to, you know, you're never attached to the four basic elements. You are attached to a cat. Here's the point. You are attached to a cat, but a cat does not exist here. So when this poor thing runs away, now you, you are worried. So you put a poster up saying cat missing, you know, reward given to <laughs> whoever can give me information to find the cat. You go from you know, door to door asking your neighbors. You have sleepless nights. If your cat goes, I mean, I'm not even talking about your child. If your cat goes missing, don't you have sleepless nights? Experience? Yes, 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 yes. You know what I'm talking about. And one day your cat's going to die. Either you're going to die, your cat's going to die. Either way, you're going to miss them. Then, if you think that you still have a cat, now, when your cat dies, you are the owner of a dead cat. You, now you're disappointed, you're sad. Piehi, vipayogo dukko. The problem is, where is the piehi? Where did that come from? This is all a product of jati, that's what I'm saying. That you created the cat in your mind. When the cat is dead, here's the only thing that happened. The four basic elements are still the four basic elements. No less. There's no longer a chitta here. Are you attached to a chitta? Is it a chitta you're attached to? Or is, are you attached to the cat? The cat. You're attached to the cat. Where's the cat? <laughs> Sir? Could we also attach for like I, me, mine? Like this of course. Cat. Yeah. But, you know, there's so many cats out there. Yeah. <laughs> there's so many cats out there. Yeah. So, and, and then you're attached to your cat, right? Yeah. So this is because of your sense, of, your sense of a self. So just as you ask yourself, where is the cat? Right? Ask the same question about yourself. Go stand in front of the mirror and ask yourself, who's that in the mirror? Mirror, mirror on the wall. <laughs> who's the stupidest of them all? <laughs> and then you'll see the answer in the mirror, staring right at you. If this is merely the four basic elements, what is this? The four basic elements. Can you be attached to the four basic elements? You can't because you never perceived it. You've only perceived sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. These are all creations of your mind. You've never perceived the four basic elements. You only know about the four basic elements because the Buddha preached it. That's why you can't attach yourself to something you don't know that exists. But there's something a bit more than that, which is the chitta. Any of you attached to a chitta? Shall I give you a pet chitta to keep? Hmm? No one, you're not, are you attached to a chitta or are you attached to your son? You're attached to your son, not to a chitta. And it's not even a single chitta, these are chittas that arise and pass away. So which chitta are you attached to, I ask you? Which chitta are you attached to? Because a chitta does not even last for the time it takes for you to identify it as a chitta. I mean, chittas rise and pass away at, at a rate that you can never perceive them. They're so fast. Yeah? So, you know, even when you put your hand out to, to grab hold of something you say you're attached to, it's changed. It's not what you, what you put your, extended your arms out to, to, to attach or to hold or to come into contact with. So, it's all so transient. 
I'm not talking about impermanence because there is nothing permanent to be impermanent. Right? I'm not talking about impermanence. I'm talking about manifestations. So, if you can let go of the cat by contemplating that way, then look at yourself in the mirror and ask, ask who is there in the mirror? Or oh, who is this? This is also the four basic elements. There's a chitta here. But this chitta thinks that this is I. This is self. That's the chitta gone mad. That's the chitta gone crazy because you entitify what you see. You think this is me, you think this is my mind, you think this is my body, the same way that you thought this is a cat. Entitification. See, therefore, when you lose a part of your body, now you suffer. Just like when you lose your cat, you suffer. Jati is the cause of all the eleven great fires. Now talk about death for a second. What is death? The death of whom? A chitta? No. Death of the Four Great Elements. Ever heard of that? Have you seen that movie? Death of the Four Great Elements. Why was that movie never made? Because the Four Great Elements? They don't die. The death is not a, not a concept that makes sense when you talk about the Four Great Elements because the Four Great Elements were always there. You, you, the Four Great Elements cannot die. Chittas, they don't last enough, long enough to die. And they arise and pass away so rapidly, so you, you can't hold on to a chitta. So what dies then? Exactly. Your entities die. That is the problem. It's like, you know, you build a sand castle on the beach. And the sea comes in and takes it away. Because the sea doesn't see a sand castle. The sea simply sees sand. It takes the sand away, it washes the sand away, and now you cry because your sand castle has just been demolished. Stupid or stupid, which one? Don't tell me both. This is why we suffer. So if you begin to understand what is really out there, right? if you understand the truth, we come back ultimately to where we started this conversation. There are only two types of minds in this world. Gone. Those with the Dhamma. And there's no Dhamma. Those with no Dhamma? Suffering. suffering. Those with the Dhamma? No suffering. no suffering. This is all there is. I, have, I started here and I explained to you how this is possible. Why it is that if you have the Dhamma there is no suffering and why when there is no Dhamma you suffer. Because when there is no Dhamma you see entities. You can't stop at the four basic elements. Remember the Venerable Sari Buddha Thera once said, I can look at a log and I can contemplate, I can see that all there is is Patavi, Tejo, Vayo and Apo. Patavi, Apo, Tejo, Vayo. I can, I can reflect on that. I can, through my wisdom eye, not his physical eye. The physical eye, I cannot see Patavi, Apo, Tejo, Vayo. Through his wisdom, he said, I can see that there's merely Patavi, Apo, Tejo, Vayo here, not a log of wood. That's what he said. So therefore, all there is is the four basic elements. They don't die. They don't decay. They don't age. Aging is a concept that is reserved for entities. Death is a concept that is reserved for entities. Breaking down, again a concept that is, or decay, a concept reserved for entities. Distancing yourself from them, from what? The four, you know, can you distance yourself from the four basic elements? For the four basic elements, try it. Hmm? This, four basic elements. What about the hand holding it? Four basic elements. Right now, take the duster away. What do you still have? The four basic elements. So have you ever distanced yourself from the four basic elements? No. The four basic elements are always there. But, if you entitify this, now this is a duster. Now if this gets taken away, now a duster has been taken away from you. Not the four basic elements. Now you suffer. You don't like dusters. Someone comes and puts a duster by your side. What's just come to you? In real terms, the four basic elements. But in your mind, a duster. You don't like dusters. Now you suffer. You like dusters and they don't give it to you. What you like, you don't get. What is there to like? Do you like the four basic elements? No, how, why not? 
You've never seen them, you don't even know about them. I mean, you do, you've never perceived them. Right? But what there is are simply the four basic elements. But yam pichang nalabati. Why nalabati? Because if you think that this is an object, now it can be taken away from you and not given to you. And it doesn't simply have to be physical objects, it can be anything. Respect, yam pichang nalabati. Love, yam pichang nalabati. All creations of the mind. Do you think people respect you? Or do they disrespect you? Someone walks up to you and then they give you something with both hands. Is that showing respect? Now this is not in a conventional sense. I want you to think of it in absolute terms. Who says that this is showing respect? Exactly. This is just a drushti. But if you have that, remember drushtis are all used in creation of mental formations. Right? It's not, the, it's not in the vipaka process. It's all creations of the mental, the mental image, the mental analysis that comes later, subsequent to the actual vipaka object. That's why I said these are the layers that you keep adding on. So you walk into the room and people stand up. You think, oh, they're respecting me. Says who? Let's just say in one culture, when people stand up, it is to say that you should leave the room immediately, they don't like you very much. Right? Now, now, so who, which one's the respect? Standing up or not standing up? Is respect an intrinsic part of an action? No. If someone holds something in both hands, is that showing respect? No. You can think of it as, as, as showing respect if you have the drushti. What comes with the drushti? Manadam. Not aharupa. Not eye and sight. But mind and dhamma. So when someone stands up and you think they respect you, this is all a creation of the mind. And then you like them because they respect you. If they don't respect you, you dislike them. Now you suffer. Yampi <laughs> channa Right. I don't know how people live like this, honestly. Last one. Just with the comment, you know how we venerate the Buddha? They're qualities. They're not entities, but they're qualities. So, kindness. Take kindness. Kindness is a quality. It's a quality of the mind. So, kindness is a quality. It's not a fixed quality. Nothing is fixed. But kindness is a quality. So when we venerate the Mahasanga or the Buddha or whatever, we, that's why we, we, you know, when we chant the Buddha Guna, remember this is the Buddha Guna. These are the virtues. We don't, chant, we don't venerate the Buddha per se. We venerate the qualities that the Buddha represents. These qualities are qualities of the mind. Like, for example, there's the quality of gravity. That's a quality. Then there's a quality of kindness and gentleness and softness and humility and humbleness and you know, greatness and all these. These are qualities of the mind. So the, the mind, there's raga. Raga is a quality. But we don't venerate that. We try to rid ourselves of that. Dvesha is a quality. Right? Atta attachment is a, is a function of the mind which comes out of ignorance. Greed is a quality. We don't venerate that. We want to get rid of that because it causes us suffering. But charity, that's a quality. Generosity, that's a quality. Gentleness, kindness, these are qualities. These qualities, what do we mean by venerating them? What we're really saying is we want them to be, we want to aspire to them. Why so? Because it frees us from suffering. When you are generous, you have the mindset of letting go. When you are greedy, you have the mindset of attaching yourself and hoarding and, 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 and collecting and accumulating all the time, causing suffering because the more you have, the more you have to suffer. So when we, when we make our veneration, when we pay our respects, what we do is we, we revere those qualities. You can't say those qualities don't exist because there is the satradhatu, which is the four basic elements. There are the chittas. Right? And those chittas, they bear qualities. The chittas have temperaments. Raga is a quality. Vita Raga is another quality. Dvesha is a quality. Vita Dosa is another quality. Moha is a quality. Vita Moha is a quality. Those qualities also exist because if they were no qualities, then chittas wouldn't be there either. Chittas and Chaitasikas, the two of them in combination, they manifest these qualities. Wisdom is a quality. Samadhi is a quality. Virtue is a quality. You can be virtuous or you can be unvirtuous. 
They're both qualities. So we venerate virtuousness. We try to dispel unvirtuousness. We don't want unvirtuousness because it's not good. It, it hurts us. That's why it's not good. No other reason. You know, we, the only reason we don't like greed is because it, it brings suffering. That's why. Otherwise, there's no problem with greed. Hatred? What's the problem with hatred? It brings suffering. That's why we don't like it. Otherwise, it's, it's fine. <laughs> hatred is fine. But it brings suffering because all of us are tr striving to be free from suffering, aren't we? So therefore, if there are any qualities, there are guna and no guna. Basically, they're both guna. In other words, qualities. There are good qualities and bad qualities. Why are some qualities good? Because they lead you to freedom from suffering. Why are some qualities bad? Because they lead you to suffering. That's why. All minds want to be free of suffering. Sabbe satta, bhavantu sukitatta. All minds wish to be free of suffering. So if all minds wish to be free of suffering, then all minds must aspire to, to, to acquire the qualities that lead them to freedom from suffering. That's why we venerate them. Veneration is not merely bringing our hands together and saying sadhu sadhu. Veneration, as we talked about the last time we had the Saturday session, is to try and, remember we talked about the dhatu, uh, the depositing the, uh, the relics and so on, and why we do it, right? So what we talked about that day was, these qualities are what we, have to, what we want to try to become within ourselves so that we, we can be free of suffering, that's all. That is what a vandana is. That is what a worship is. Aspiring to acquire those qualities within our own minds so that we, we can be free of suffering. Make sense? Good. Welcome. Right, let's take a moment to answer the merits and bring the sermon to a close. Let's take a moment then to transfer the merits that we have all acquired today by making offerings to the infinite virtues of the Noble Triple Gem listening to the Dhamma and inviting the Swami Nansi to deliver the sermon, as well as creating a conducive environment for all to come along and practice the Dhamma and aspire to Nibbana. First and foremost, let us remind ourselves how incredibly fortunate we are to be in, present, in the presence of the Buddha's teaching. Let us, with immense gratitude, transfer these merits to the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasikas, who since time immemorial have protected and preserved the sublime teachings of the Buddha and passed it down to the generations of the noble lineage in the form of the Tripitaka, which is thankfully available to us today to study, understand, and comprehend the Dhamma. Let us also transfer these merits to all members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all of the chapters who have dedicated their lives to the noble path and have committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us not forget that amongst them are the monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries who have always been by your side through thick and thin, come rain or shine. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to our teachers, Guru Swami Nuhanse, as well as all the monks resident at the monastery and the Anagarika and Anagarika communities attached to the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these maids and express our gratitude to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by transliterating these talks, sharing them out with others or inviting others to join them. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer these maids to our devotees and friends of the monastery who for the sake of merits to help them attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana, continue to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes everyone from those of you who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes and medicines as well as those who extend their know-how and continue to extend their well wishes. May they all rejoice in these merits and by the power of these merits may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcoming obstacles to their spiritual progress. Progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. <coughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these maids from mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews, and nieces, our friends, our acquaintances, our employers, our employees, our teachers, and anyone and everyone who've gone the extra mile and left no stone unturned in their quest to help us live a comfortable life and support us, assist us, and help us in any way, shape, or form. May they all rejoice in these merits by the power of these merits. May they be also healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to the devas and brahmas, spirits and demons, primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who have committed themselves to fulfilling and preserving the Sambhuddha Sasana. Let us transfer these maids to our guardian deities who keep a watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way. May they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these maids 
to those who passed away, in our names, in our loved ones, our forefathers, our ancestors, reminding ourselves that it is in their blood, sweat and tears today we are able to live a comfortable life in peace and harmony and practice the path comfortably. Let us take a moment to transfer these merits to members of the armed forces as well as the police force who sacrificed their lives to protect the peace and harmony of our nation as well as those who have lost their lives in the wars, be their friend or foe. Let us also transfer these merits to those who have lost their lives to natural disasters and calamities such as the tsunamis and earthquakes, landslides, fires, floods and various other natural disasters, as well as the pandemics, reminding ourselves that in this infinitely long journey of Sansara, they will all have been friends to us, acquaintances to us, fathers and mothers to us, brothers and sisters to us, those who will have helped us, supported us, and assisted us in any way, shape, or form possible and available to them. Therefore, out of a sense of gratitude, let us take a moment to transfer all the merits that we have all acquired and out of deep compassion towards all of them, transfer these merits to all of them. May by the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, they redeem themselves to be born in the blissful plain. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, may by the power of all the blessings and the merits we have acquired throughout the day, we be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of Arahants on this blessed land. And may you and I and everyone who's helped make this program a success become a Rahatan Nuhanse or an Arahat Terani Nuhanse in this very life itself and in the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha himself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all. The members of the Mahasangha will transfer their blessings to you now. Raga ginnen midatnva Dvesha ginnen midatnva Moha ginnen midatnva Nibbana parama sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Param Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Mamada Sialu Loka Sialu Satnvayo Nibbana param sukhayan Sukhita tara vetnva Nibbana param sukhayan Sukhita tara vetnva Nibbana param sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Raga Gini Niveva Dvesha Gini Niveva Moha Gini Niveva Nivan Sapa Labeva Nivan Sapa Labeva Nivan Sapa Labeva Tunran Gay Suis Yananta Maha Gunabelin Silo Loka Silo Satyoma Nibana Paramasukin Sukhita Darvetva Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu